For centuries, the church has used what's called the church calendar. The church calendar is there to help the church tell the narrative of God, of Jesus, the Holy Spirit, and the church so that we never lose the story of Scripture, so that we never lose the story of our salvation. And the calendar is a resource. It's not something the church has to follow, but the church often does follow it so that we stay in line with the teaching of God and we understand where our salvation comes from. There's times when the church will go a different direction and do a series that's not in alignment with the calendar, but the calendar uh, often tells us about the scripture readings that we hear each week. Uh, They schedule the readings, uh, and people often preach from the calendar. Now, when we look at the calendar for today, May 22nd, today is Trinity Sunday on the church calendar. It's the Sunday to really focus on this core teaching of our faith, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now, last week was Pentecost Sunday on the church calendar. And when you combine these two really important topics together, what you get is a really important theme, God's heart for lost people. And that's why I've titled this message, Lost and Found. We're going to talk today about God's heart for lost people. Look at this. God, the Father, sent his son, Jesus Christ, on a mission for lost people. Jesus was born, and after he began his public ministry, he frequently told of his mission This is what he said frequently. The Son of Man came to seek and to, would you say the rest with me, save the lost. That's what Jesus came to do. And he wanted everyone else to know that was his mission. So during his time on earth, he went north, he went south, but he stayed within a geographic region of Israel and Palestine. He went all the way up north to Tyre. He went down north of Jerusalem And he performed ministry. He suffered and he died for the whole world, but that happened within a specific geographic confines. He did that to save the lost. And then he ascended into heaven, and then it came time for God to send the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit came on a mission. And that mission was for lost people, for people who didn't know God, for people who thought they knew God, and didn't know him. See, when Jesus did ministry, he came for the religious and the irreligious because all of them had a skewed view of who who God was. The Holy Spirit arrived, and this ministry of Jesus that was contained within a specific geographic boundary, the Spirit arrived to get that message out, to get it out all over the world. And so what we have at Pentecost, when the Spirit arrived, is every nation under heaven there, in one place. And what happens? There were staying in Jerusalem God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. That's a big representation. And from there, the Holy Spirit sent the church on a mission. And from that point forward, the church has been going all over the world. On that day of Pentecost, this is really important, 3,000 people were added to the church. That is remarkable. So Pentecost mission accomplished, right? Wrong. Pentecost mission launched. Now the mission has a church. Many people say the church has a mission, but the right way to think about it is the mission of God now has a church. And that's you. And that's me. And God has given each one of us a heart transplant. When we were saved, we received a love for lost people. So this, friends, is now our mission. It's your mission to love the lost. And the mission isn't over, and it won't be over until Jesus Christ comes back. And he does it through you and me. 
Here's what Scripture says. First Timothy, Paul wrote this, God our Savior wants all people to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. There are billions of people right now who are alive, but they are spiritually dead. They're walking dead people. Do you love them? See, this is a big problem, and our heart should break for them. And the question for us is, what's God doing about this problem? What's he doing about it? I'm going to give you the answer right now. I want you to look around the room. Go ahead. Take a look. That's what he did about it. You're the solution. I'm the solution. You're looking at it. There was a friend who once griped to God and said this, Why won't you help? Won't you do something about this? Angry with God. And God said this, I did. I created you. I created you to do something about it. I've equipped you. I've sent you to go and be my hands and my feet. See, there is a problem in our world, but God came to resolve the issue. He sent his son Jesus, right? And Jesus went on a mission. He suffered and he died on that cross for the whole world. And now that love is pouring out through, to the whole world through his church. And so there's a mission for the church to seek and to save the lost. There's a mission for the church to go and make disciples. And if we don't hold to this mission, we're no different than a glorified country club. We are on a mission, friends. And here's how we phrase it. It's phrased in several different ways in Scripture, but here's how we've come up with it. Connecting people with Jesus and each other. Would you say that out loud with me? Connecting people with Jesus and each other. God comes to hold us together as his family and then connect people with Jesus, because Jesus is the only way. So do you have a love for lost people? You know, there's people who say to hell with them. There's people who say that. Sinners, people who are far from God, they say to hell with them. But that's not the church's response. And that's not God's response. And I pray that that's not your response. Our church needs to have a passion for lost people. And they're all around us, aren't they? They're in our families. Some of them are in our homes. They're in our workplace. They're when we drive and they make us mad. They're everywhere. People who don't care about God, who don't want to know God, who don't care about the church, who say to hell with the church. But the church has a love and a deep passion for lost people, for the unlovable. Because you know why? When you were lost, God came for you and he loved you and he loved me when we didn't deserve it, when we didn't ask for it. We were once lost and now we're found. Praise the Lord. And now you have this same mission. This mission has been granted. It's been infused in you and in me. So the church isn't dead. God's not dead. What's God doing about it? Take a look. It's you and it's me. And it's been a part of our church ever since we were started, 26 years ago by Pastor Scott Rishi to have a passion for the lost. Pastor Scott, he said this, we need to talk to God about the lost before we try to talk to the lost about God. Do you get that? We need to talk to God about the lost because then we will share in his passion and his concern before we try talking to the lost about God. So here's my question for you this morning is are you talking to God about the lost? Is it part of your conversation? Or have you grown lukewarm? Have you grown cold for people far from God? 
Oftentimes we can make our prayers more about us rather than about them. God's greatest conviction is for people who don't know him. That's his greatest conviction. And I pray that that's your conviction. Are you talking to God about the lost? They're everywhere. They're in your homes. Are you praying for your kids? Are you praying for your coworkers? Are you praying for them? Because God wants all people to be saved, right? And come to a knowledge of the truth. So what we say, what we do, all of it matters because they're all watching. Do you truly know God, they're wondering. There's a, a famous saying from our previous uh, church body president, Jerry Kieschnick, and the current president is Matthew Harrison. He's the 13th president of the LCMS, but Jerry's the 12th president, and I had a, several opportunities to meet him, and he has a passion for people who don't know God, and he had a strong way of uh, sharing his conviction. He would say this, time is short, and hell is hot. It shows the urgency that the church must have for people who don't know God. Because hell is right around the corner for people who don't know him. And if you don't believe that hell exists, then look at the scripture because it's from beginning to end. And it should grieve our hearts, church, to think that people are headed there. We want people to know God. Time is short and hell is hot. So are you in conversation with God about lost people? I want you to pray for them. That's a big application from today. I want you to pray for people that you know that they would come to know God, that they would turn from their sin, and that they would repent. And I want you then to stop praying. Because eventually I want your prayer with your hands to turn into a prayer with your feet. And to go and be with lost people, to go influence them. What can happen with the church is sometimes we're so consumed with our own that we never even put ourselves in the circle with lost people. So I want you to be with them. I want you to be the aroma of Christ out in the world. But I don't want you to be overly influenced by them because we learn from John, from 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, that the world is controlled by the evil one and their influence is pretty strong. So we as a church together need to go out and be the aroma of Christ Jesus. There's a pastor here in the area who's retired He's not really retired. You ever met people who say they're retired, but then they do more with their lives in retirement, right? Well, he's not really retired. He goes and preaches, and he's preached here a few times. His name uh, <clears throat> is uh, uh, Dennis Perryman, and he now is raising funds for Hispanic congregations in the area because uh, the trends are showing that more and more Hispanics uh, the Hispanic population is growing, and there's a need for them to know the Lord Jesus. But this is what he said. Dennis and I, we have conversation frequently about uh, the church, and this is what he said. The church exists for the unchurched. The church exists for the unchurched. He knows that, yes, it's important we feed the sheep. It's important that we care for each other, that we're there for each other during hard times, and that we grow in our faith together. But his point is made pretty clear, isn't it? That the church exists for the unchurched. That's what happened at Pentecost. When God gave birth to the church, what did the church start doing? The church went out. Thomas to India. John to Ephesus the other disciples all over the world. And they followed God's mission to go and make disciples of all nations. The church exists for the unchurched. I pray that this is your passion. Now, there's a really influential pastor. His name is Rick Warren. And he leads a church called Saddleback Community Church in California, one of the most influential churches and he has a burden, and he wants to share this burden with the world. So he started the International Day for the Unreached, and it was last Sunday on Pentecost. He knows that at Pentecost, God's word went out 
to people who were unchurched, who were unreached, who were far from God. And there's a website. I invite you to go there and check it out. But this is what Rick wrote. He said this. With more than 2 billion people who haven't had an opportunity to meet Jesus, it's time. It's time to take a radical stand and say, this has to end in our generation. And we join him and his conviction as Lord of Life Church. It's time to end this as we go and share the gospel all over the world. Today, I want to share with you really quickly three events in Scripture that really uncover God's heart for lost people. And as we closely look at these accounts in Scripture, we'll find some practical applications for our life today and how to love lost people. And interestingly enough, they all start with P. The Passover, the parable of the prodigal son, and Pentecost. At the Passover, this is really the event in the Old Testament where the angel of death passed over the doors of the Israelites in Egypt because they painted their doorposts with the blood of the lamb. And the angel of death passed by, but there were many who died that day in Egypt. Passover, though, started what is known as the event of all events in the Old Testament. That is the exodus. The exodus. When God's people exited Egypt, God heard their cry, and they exited Egypt, and they went toward the promised land. But they grumbled, and they complained, and it would have taken 40 days, but it took 40 years because they kept grumbling and complaining against God. But what's really interesting, and what many don't know about this event, is that, yes, he brought his people out, the Jews. He brought his people out of Egypt, but at the same time, if you read Exodus 11 and 12, those two chapters, you learn that God also brought out other people. He brought out hired workers, slaves, servants, Egyptians, other people than his own he brought out of Egypt. We often think that it was only the Jews. But it was so much more than that. God's heart at that moment was beating for the world as he migrated his people out. The next one is the parable of the prodigal son. And this is the heartbeat of God. There you have a son who is lost, literally, with pigs. And he has squandered everything. And he comes back home, and the father runs out and wraps his arms around the lost son. That is a clear picture, friends, of God's heart for lost people. The next one is Pentecost, when God sent the church out. And the church was stuck and closed up in fear behind closed doors. Behind closed doors. Because they were afraid of the Jews. But once the Holy Spirit arrived, then they went out boldly. And they shared the good news with the whole world. Every nation under heaven. People began speaking in languages that they didn't normally speak, and the Holy Spirit enabled them to speak these languages so that everyone from every nation could hear the good news of Jesus. God's heart for lost people. And what I want to do is share with you two specific practical applications that we can take from all three of these stories. I want you to write these down if you're taking notes. First, I want to note this, that the whole Bible is a book about God bringing home his lost people. The whole book is about it. The first one is this. God uses people to reach people. There is nothing to get you off the hook from sharing the gospel. Sometimes we look for things that get us off the hook, an alternative, right? Oh, that's for pastor to do. That's for these people to do. I'm not really going to do that. Well, there's nothing to get us off the hook when it comes to proclaiming the gospel. We live in a digital age today, and there are so many things on the internet that can do things conveniently for us, things that make it convenient and that do it the short way, the digital way, right? A click of a button, 
And wouldn't it be nice if we could just flip on the faith switch for people? Wouldn't it be nice if we could plug them into the Christian outlet and it'd be done? Wouldn't it be nice if we could scan the Christian barcode and it'd all be done? They'd become Jesus followers. But God still does it the long way. He still does it with people just like you. People interacting with other people because at the heart of the gospel message is what it means to be human. The forgiveness of sins clearing your conscience. The love of God filling your heart. The truth of God directing your decisions. Your behavior. The purposes of God now directing your path. It's all what it means to be human and it means a human must share it with another human. There's tools that we use like this, like this, like microphones, but you know what? It's people talking to people and there's nothing to get you off the hook. It's you and it's me. You're God's plan A and there is no plan B. There's no alternative. So friends, let's step out. Let's be bold. I shared a message to the youth last Sunday to not be timid in their faith. I say to you today, church, don't be timid in your faith. It's time to wake up. This is for us to do. It's for you and for me. The next one is this. They went out. Moses and Aaron and the others, they went out of Egypt, right? And as they went along, they included people from other nations who repented and they joined in and there were people of Jews who kept grumbling and complained and they died off. And so about two million people eventually entered the promised land. People who were Jews and non-Jews. But guess what? They went out. God went out. He heard their cry and he went out and he saved them. The next one is this that and the parable of the prodigal son, I love this. The son ran home, and what did the father do? He didn't wait for the son to open the door and come in. The father went out and wrapped his arms around him. And someone in this church told me this, and I hadn't thought about it this way until recently, but the father wrapped his arms around him because he wanted to protect the son from being stoned. That son would have been stoned because he had squandered half of the inheritance the father went out the next one is Pentecost these Jesus followers were stuck behind closed doors and then they finally broke free from those doors and they went out and they went into the streets and Paul uh, eventually went out right Peter that day went out and he preached and 3,000 people were added to the day there in the streets he went out so church we need to go out this here is your airport this is where you get fueled. This is where we come together in the fellowship and support of God's people. But then it's time to fly. And it's time we go out and lift off in your circles, in my circles, to be the aroma of Christ Jesus. So we got to get out. I love how so many people have signed up for our All Church Monthly Community Outreach. That's a mouthful, I know. All Church Monthly Community Outreach. But I started online registrations on Tuesday and it's already filled. Praise the Lord. We want to get out. We want to share the love of Jesus. That's the heart of our church. Stay tuned for the details of the June outreach event. This last Tuesday, our own Brian Zilke went out and he went to the Caneland High School Baccalaureate in a public school and he preached the good news of Jesus Christ. If you're not signed up for our news and events email, I included it in there. I click for you to watch it, and it's powerful. Think about that. In a public school setting today to share the name of Jesus Christ. Wow. He went out. I think of also Pat Board. He's a member of our church. He went out. I just talked to him this week, and I asked if he'd be willing to share his testimony with you today about how God worked in his life. And so I'd like to invite Pat forward at this time to share with you a really special story. Would you please give him a warm Lord of Life welcome. Good morning, church. Thank morning. you. Um, 
this is out of my comfort zone, believe me. Uh, I think back in high school, oral communications, I think I got a D. But uh, anyways, uh, I'd like to read something to you. Uh, I was in Trader Joe's about a week ago. I was checking out a young store clerk. I was checking out. <laughs> a young <laughs> store clerk said, said to me, I like your freedom shirt. And I'm wearing it. And um, sorry, getting a little nervous. Uh, I said, thank you. Uh, I said, so do I. But I asked him, did you notice the cross? There's a small little cross up here. He said, no. Uh, then he asked me if that was his church shirt. I asked him, would it matter? Then he asked me if I was a believer. I said, yes, I believe in the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Then I asked him if he believed. He, he said, not so much. Then he asked me, why do I believe? Because I, I told him, God has been with me all, my whole life through uh, good times and bad times. Maybe and hopefully I planted a seed for him to think about the next time he was in a bad situation. And then the second part, but then I uh, really thought about it, freedom. How did I really become free? And I stood before this cross. Uh, Pastor Matt was in a staff meeting. He's, uh, I said, well, I told him, well, I'll wait down in the sanctuary. Uh, when, you know, give me a call when you're done. Well, it was a little extended, so I spent a lot of time down here. And uh, I got to looking at the cross. And I put my hand on the nail that nailed his feet uh, to the cross. Um, and, and I started to realize that there was a real man that was nailed to the cross, and it was my Lord. I fell to my knees, and I said, sorry, forgive me my sins that nailed you to this cross, which is the freedom that gave us our self salvation. And I like to read Thessalonians uh, 3 9 says, how, how can we thank God enough for you in return for all the joys we have in the presence of our God because of you, the church, in the body of Christ? And I like to thank my mother, uh, Pastor Matt, Kurt and Jan Berg, Paula, Anna, and Evan Price, the Johnson family. Kurt Oswald, Tom, Hal, and Karen, and I thank you, the church, so much. Thank you. I really appreciate Pat um, getting up here and saying that, and Pat's going through a really difficult time uh, right now, and he'd ask for us to, uh, to pray over him. So would you please join me in prayer? Lord God, I thank you for Pat and his boldness of faith. Uh, for opening up that door for him to share the good news of Jesus right there in the grocery store. Uh, I pray, Lord, that that would be infectious for us, that it would be contagious for us today, that we would be bold and not timid, that we would know that uh, time is short and hell is hot. And, Lord, we, we know that you love all people and you want people to be saved. So, Lord, make us uh, the aroma of Jesus. I thank you for Pat and that he is the aroma of Christ. I thank you, Lord, for uh, his life and for our fellowship together. I pray that you bless him and I pray that you would help him through these difficult times and that we, the church, would be here uh, to walk with him uh, through these challenges and that he would know that we're here with him and that you're with him through the ups and the downs of life and that you can use our difficult times to glorify yourself. So, Lord, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you very much, Pat. So as we wrap up, uh, I want to ask you this question. Are you talking to God about the lost? That's what I want you to take away from this sermon because if you talk to God about the lost, your heart will begin to get shaped like God's heart. As you read the scripture, it's a book about God's heart for lost people. There's a quote I heard this last week, and I want to share it with you. If you're sitting on the premises... How can you stand on the promises? That means get out. So church, to wrap up, God sent his son 
the Holy Spirit and the church to reach lost people. As his church, let's go out and let's love lost people for Jesus Christ's sake. Amen? Amen.